homestand for the Mets and who's in town a team that's never been here before the Chicago White Sox their first trip to Flushing but an old hand at the helm the king of the Grand Slam single is here along with a 400 home run hitter trying to find some hay against the Mets team that's just trying to play some baseball too many off days too many rainouts the Mets are ready to go on a six game homestand. At City Field in New York, the New York Mets play the Chicago White Sox. Tuesday night baseball is presented by City. And a pleasant good evening, everybody, and welcome to City Field. Gary Cohn, Ron Darling with you tonight as the Mets open a two-game series against the Chicago White Sox. First time the White Sox have ever been in Flushing. And Matt Harvey will pitch for the first time in his career on seven days rest. Harvey has had two no decisions in a row after winning his first four starts. So the big question is, what does pitching on the eighth day mean for Matt? Well, the great thing about Matt Harvey is that he has not used any excuses. Think about his first start this year. It was going to be extremely cold weather. They asked him how he was going to deal with the cold weather. He said, listen, I'm from Connecticut. I pitched my whole life in cold weather. No problem. I'm sure it's going to be like that tonight. Will he have a little extra on the fastball? Of course he will. But he's a guy that's not made any excuses, and I look for him to have a big game against the swing and miss Chicago White Sox. And he's pitching against the local kid, left-hander Hector Santiago, who grew up in Newark, big Mets fan, and he'll be pitching for the White Sox tonight. And the White Sox, a team that last year was in first place for most of the season in the American League Central, and Robin Ventura's first year as skipper, they've had trouble getting out of their own way this year. They have. They faltered down the stretch last year. Detroit caught them. When you look at this ball club, it's a club that has a lot of big swingers, a a lot of good hitters. They have not gotten off track. Harvey gets a break tonight because I think Paul Konerko is one of the most underrated right-handed hitters in baseball, but they still have enough firepower to hurt you, even though they strike out so much. And, of course, they have big Adam Dunn, who's off to a slow start, but he's good for 40 home runs just about every year. It's the Mets and the White Sox in Flushing for the first time ever. All the action coming your way tonight on SNY. by City, proud sponsor of the New York Mets. By ESPN New York, 98.7 FM. By Bud Light, it's the sure sign of a good time. Here we go. 
by State Farm. Today's State Farm agent of the game is John Garfinkel of Brooklyn. Contact John's office at johngarfinkel.com. And by Subway Restaurant, Subway Eat Fresh. Get to City Field Saturday afternoon and be part of the Mets tradition, Banner Day. Visit Mets.com slash Banner Day for details and tickets. Here's your Mets upcoming schedule. You can listen to all Mets games on Sports Radio 66 and Sports Radio 101.9 FM, WFAN. Two with the White Sox, then four with the Pirates. And then the Mets' next road trip takes them to St. Louis, which has the best record in the National League. What else is new? <laughs> and then the other Chicago team, they go and play the Cubs for three games, three day games at Wrigley Field, just like it was meant to be. Matt Harvey making his way in. Getting ready for his seventh start of the year. First pitch from City Field is coming right up. for the Chicago White Sox the lowest scoring team in the American League Adam Dunn plays first base Paul Canerco who uh, normally shares first base and DH with Dunn will sit on the bench for the first game of this series Connor Gillespie who they picked up in spring training from the Giants has probably been their best hitter so far this year a lot of ex Met flavor you got Jeff Kepinger playing second base and certainly plenty of ex Met flavor on the White Sox coaching staff right. going up against Terry Collins team tonight there's Robin Ventura in his second year as the skipper of the White Sox terrific first year not so great this year and he's got Mets ex Mets coaching on <laughs> both base both baselines as well. Robin Ventura was one of those guys you couldn't tell if he had four hits in the game and no hits in the game he was just a winning player. It's amazing the influence that Robin had and the lasting um, legacy with the Mets considering the fact he was only here for three years of course there were three pretty good years 99 and 2000 they went to the postseason went to the World Series in 2000 um, but the Grand Slam single the the hit against the Pirates the last weekend in 99 the, the Grand Slams at both ends of double headers um, the leadership that he showed on those Mets teams he really was and, and no offense to Johnny Franco who was the captain of those teams but Ventura was 
among the position players. He was the guy that everybody looked to for that calming influence. And in this business, this goes a long way, Gary. I'll always remember him. First World Series I ever worked. I had to ask players after a game some questions. He was nice enough to consent. Great interview. Speaking of Johnny Franco, the erstwhile captain of the Mets, and there he is with Robin. They were great teammates on those Mets teams of 99 through 01. I remember pitching against Robin when he was in the American League with the White Sox, and he was unbelievable defensive player and just impossible to get out, especially put the bases loaded. What, 18 Grand Slam home runs? And then the one that didn't count as a Grand right. Slam. And Probably, you know, lasts in memory longer because of the fact that he got tackled by Todd Pratt before he could get to second base. Matt Harvey ready to go, and Mets taking the field on a uh, what was a tremendous day in New York. Temperature got to the low 70s, sunshine all day. It's clouded up now. There's a chance of rain tomorrow. In fact, uh, they're rained out in Washington tonight. They have a rain delay in Cincinnati, so there's weather on the way. But for one night, the Mets could not have to worry about the weather as Matt Harvey takes them out. Well, when you look at Matt Harvey and the numbers here presented by Jaguar, he's trying to right the ship. It's hard to right the ship when you're 4-0 and 1.56, but his last start um, didn't make it through six innings, through 121 pitches, so wants to be a little more efficient tonight. That was the game a week ago Monday in Miami that wound up going 15 innings. So Lexus defense behind Matt. Lucas Duda, 27 start, leads all Met outfielders. Lagares, Brown, of course, right to Hata Murphy Davis in the infield, and every day John Buck you behind know, the plate. We've talked a lot in the last uh, 48 hours or so about Harvey and the fact that because of the rain out Saturday, he gets pushed back tonight, working on seven days rest. But it's not just Matt, it's this entire yeah. team. They've played two games in the last five days, and that's very unusual in baseball. You know, I was talking to a lot of the coaches for the Mets today about the, you know, the temperature of the team, and he said everyone to a man is so frustrated with not being able to play every day. And Terry Collins addressed it today. He would like to see them play every day to get the rotation a little bit of tempo. But of course, what you said uh, about the weather tomorrow. There's the uh, ceremonial first pitch just a bit outside. I, I cracked the camera again. Didn't we do what last last home stand? Unbelievable. Uh, I, I do have to say though and this is nothing against you people throughout the first pitch. Um, not a lot of people throw very well. I mean that, what is it. Well here's what I believe. I believe that if you're throwing out a ceremonial first pitch you owe it to yourself. Not to go up on the dirt, to stand on the grass in front of okay. the mound and throw from there from about 45 feet. 45 feet. The problem is there's a little gulp that happens right in the throat area right before you make that throw on the big league mound. Well, we talked about the uh, Mets' influence on this White Sox coaching staff. There's Daryl Boston, who played three years with the Mets, and he's the first base coach. And over on the other side, one of the all time crowd favorites at Shea Stadium, Joe McEwing. Better known as the little unit for his prowess against Randy Johnson. Boy, that's quite a feather in your cap to take him down. <laughs> Alejandro Diaz will lead off for the White Sox, who are 13 and 17 to begin the year. Last in the American League in run scored, last in batting average, last in on base percentage, and at the top of the order, Diaz with that 286 on base percentage. Well, it's been a few days since the Mets have played, and this game starts four minutes late. First pitch of the night by Harvey is taken for a strike. Well that's probably why because Matt Harvey has been dealing with a bloody nose. We oh, saw wow. him dabbing at that nose coming in from the bullpen and going out to the mound. And so unable to stem that bleeding Matt takes the mound nonetheless. And when he wipes it on his uniform shirt. It'll be like the bloody sock. That's Gets the curveball in for a strike, and it's one and two. Legends grow in different ways, Gary. Jeff Kepinger, a former Met, waiting on deck. Alex Rios behind him for the White Sox. Harvey's one two to Deaza, and he fouls it back at 94 miles an hour. Command of the fastball was the big issue with Harvey in that last start in Miami. 
just couldn't throw it where he wanted to. Well, that, you know, that's always the key for every pitcher, but you're right. Uh, the one thing about getting out of the blocks is that he had just great command of that fastball. Can I tell you something? If I'm a hitter, it's a little disconcerting when a guy throwing 99 miles an hour, his nose is bleeding, he's not even recognizing it. Now, we all know that foreign substances can do different things to baseballs. It's a way for a pitcher to take advantage of a bloody nose. Line down the left field line, and Duda back toward the corner makes the catch in fair territory for the first down of the night. Well, Matt trying to dab at that nose with his a sleeve of, a, of his shirt. I've had so, that happen before. Sorry, Gary. I've had that happen a couple times before. He just usually takes some cotton and then put it up there a little, makes it hard to breathe. Yeah, you don't want to be doing that while you're playing. You'd rather do that in the dugout to try and stanch the bleeding. As one who's had plenty of bloody noses myself, sometimes it takes a while for that blood to clot and stop. Here's Jeff Kepinger. Slaps one the other way, and that's a foul ball. That's Kepinger's game. He goes after first pitches all the time. He's lasted a long time in the major leagues. Played for the Mets back in 04, but he does not take a lot of pitches. Well, he's a guy that you don't usually strike out. He's got a very short stroke. Um, a lot of guys who have played with him will tell you he knows as much about hitting as anyone in the game. Seventh major league team played last year and played very well for Tampa Bay. He hit 325 for the Rays last year. It's a very unusual stance. And he flies one out to right, and Andrew Brown playing his first game at City Field makes the grab for the second out. Andrew's second start playing in right field joined the Mets on the last road trip. But they sent Colin Cowgill down. So two out and nobody on, and now the veteran Alex Rios. Rios with seven home runs, 15 runs batted in. The White Sox are a team very dependent on the home run and they get a lot of them with guys like Adam Dunn and Paul Canerco but they also have some home runs on the disabled list right now guys like Diane Piciato who had 25 last year and Gordon Beckham who had 16 last year the problem is they're not scoring at all unless they get the home run it's almost half their runs right are scored by the home run if the Mets are a team of find the right pitch to hit the White Sox are grip it and rip it Here's the 0-2 and a late swing foul by Rios. Well, that's the problem with the White Sox. Here's Paul Canerco who's sitting because the Mets in the National League Park don't use the DH. And Buck first blocks the breaking ball and then asks for help, but no swing by Rios. One and two. Rios last year, 21 homers, 91 RBIs, 304 average. But like so many of the Sox, he's st stuck in a big slump right now. Adam Dunn on day. Rios, who came up with the Blue Jays over first round pick, fouls off that 96 mile an hour fastball. Well, it's early, but already we have a Cholula. Flamethrower. Well, we had the mariachi band before the game. We might as well go with the Cholula. Cinco de Mayo plus dos. <laughs> Here's the one two. Swing and a miss. He got him with the slider. Harvey's first strikeout caps a one, two, three first inning. Mets come to bat against the local kid, Hector Santiago, when we come back.
Well, the uh, bloody nose had no impact on Matt Harvey's pitching in that first inning, but he'll head, head down the tunnel with the trainer Ray Ramirez, see if he can stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, the Mets come to bat against Hector Santiago. Ruben Tejada leads off. And Santiago throws a first pitch strike. There's your Geico Mets starting lineup. Andrew Brown gets his second start. Juan Lagares gets his fifth start. Otherwise, the regular unit out there for the Mets as they continue to mix and match in center and right field. Tejada fouls one off, and Santiago gets ahead 0 2. Well, Santiago is just a fantastic story. Uh, a guy that was a 30th round pick. He can throw 90 plus. He's got an unusual pitch that you never see. A great screwball, as you can see his numbers uh, from Toyota. Five career starts, a 1.82 ERA for a guy who won the closer uh, job last year. Throws hard, has the good changeup, and throw a lot of other pitches as well. And for Santiago, he's got to be so pumped up. He grew up in Newark. He's a, he was a huge Mets fan, as was his entire family, much of which is here tonight. Tejada hits one out to center field. Wise got a late jump, but he tracks the ball well and makes the grab. He's got a real quick motion. It reminds me a little bit of a former Chicago White Sox left-hander, Wilson Alvarez. Kind of a short left-hander. Lots of power. Doesn't use his legs too much, but you can see very powerful built. Uh, young man, more like a wrestler's body. Went to Bloomfield Tech in Bloomfield, New Jersey, right near Newark. Here's Daniel Murphy, just five for his last 35. His average down to 283 for the year. And he hits one toward the hole, and that's in for a base hit. So Murphy with a one out single, and the Mets out the first base runner of the night. Well, sometimes, uh, you know, you're trying to track the right pitch. Sometimes you're late and it surprises you, breaks your bat, and you get a little lucky just furtsing that thing into left field. So one out and one on for David Wright, who finished the road trip, homering in each of the last three games. David has homered in as many as four straight games in his career. The one he hit on Friday night against Craig Kimbrell was almost unbelievable. Especially since he had thrown two balls by him down and in, which is usually his strength, and the ball up and away was able to tattoo. And he hit it 464 feet to right center field, which was the longest home run ever against Kimbrell by more than 40 feet. It, uh, when he hit it to center field, my first thought is get up, you know, have a chance to go over the fence. And then where it landed, I've honestly never seen a ball land on all the games that we've done in Atlanta. Certainly not by a right hand batter. Santiago throws the changeup outside 2 and 0. He doesn't really have a base. Very, very narrow beginning to the windup. And you can see he throws across that kind of Oliver Perez front where his foot is facing towards the Mets dugout. Well, I'll tell you what, watching his foot come off the rubber like that, you know who it reminds me of? John Franco, who happened to be Hector Santiago's hero. When he was growing up in Newark, he has some of the same mannerisms, you know, very kind of uh, agitated personality, quick to the plate. Throws that screwball the way Johnny used to throw it, turning over the changeup. And it's a fastball for a strike to right. It's two and two. 93 from Santiago. David hitting a 313 for the year. Back to Santiago, 25 years old. David fouls away the fastball. He's showing a lot of guts right away, isn't he? Going right after David Wright, especially inside with that fastball. This is only his second start of the year. He began the year in the bullpen, made seven relief outings. His last start, his first of the year, he went up against one of the best lineups in baseball and pitched five and a third against Texas, allowed one run and two hits. So he's already enjoyed some instant success in a White Sox rotation that's been torn up a little bit. They've had to push Jake Peavy back a couple of times. He's finally going to pitch tomorrow night. Gavin Floyd today had Tommy John surgery. He's going to miss not only this year, but maybe all of next year as well. And John Danks has been out of the rotation. So that's given Santiago a chance to start. I think it's, uh, you were talking about being nervous. I think it's so hard to pitch in the ballpark that not, he did not come here at Cubs Shea Stadium, but against the team that you rooted for the first time I ever did it. 
of course, warming up for game four of the World Series. It was 20 minutes of hyperventilation. <laughs> so I don't know how it affected Santiago today. Seventh pitch of the at bat coming to right, and he skips out of the way of the breaking ball. Three and two. Well, maybe it helps Santiago the fact that uh, some of the players he grew up rooting for, he's with every day. That's right. Ventura and McEwing, people like that. Three and two with one out. Let's see if Murphy's running. He is going, and the pitch bounces away. Murphy takes the turn, but he'll hold on at second as Tyler Flowers runs it down, and David Wright draws his 21st walk of the year. Well, the Mets have two men on. Here's the course light defense for the Chicago White Sox. The odds of Wise and Rios in right field. Gillespie, Ramirez, Kepinger, and Dunn in the infield, and Tyler Flowers, who's taken over for A.J. Brzezinski, who's now in Texas behind the plate. And we were talking about the home runs the White Sox have lost. That's another That's power right. source that they lost. Brzezinski had a big year for them this year. Flowers. Yeah. Not nearly the hitter that Krasinski is. Although Flowers came out of the gate with a, a lot of home runs. Well, here's John Buck. Ten home runs. That's second in the National League. Leads the league with 29 runs batted in. And an instant opportunity with first and second and one out. And a first pitch fastball for a strike. They keep throwing him first pitch fastballs <laughs> despite the fact that he said a ton of them out of the ballpark. But that was a well located fastball by Santiago. Murphy at second, he singled right at first. He won. They're the RBI leaders in the National League. And keep in mind, the Mets have played fewer games than any team in the league because of all the postponements they've had. 1 1 to Buck. And he runs that fastball on the inside corner. Buck didn't think so. Dan Iasonia, the home plate umpire, called it a strike, and it's 1 2. Did it with a smile anyway. He have to. He's a catcher. <laughs> That's right. He wants that pitch later. What we've seen about Santiago so far is that he is sneaky fast. What does that mean? You, when the ball comes out of the hand, you don't think that it has the speed on it that it does, but it catches you by surprise. Off speed, hit to center field, chasing Wise back, way back, but he has plenty of room to make the catch. And the runners will stay put. The ball is off the end of the bat, but. Wise plays shallow. He's a very good defensive outfielder. Well, one of the best ever, one of the greatest catches ever in the perfect game by Mark Burley. But he gets back there. You can see he gets behind the baseball. And Murphy gets off. And I think that because of the speed of Wise running back on that, it confused Murph because that's one he could have definitely tagged up on. So now two out of two on. It's left to Lucas Duda. Lucas just three for 16 with runners in scoring position this year. That's why he has six home runs, but only 10 RBIs. The on base percentage is high, the slugging percentage is high, but the production still waiting. Two out and two on. And Lucas takes a fastball for a strength. Dave Hudgens has been encouraging Lucas in RBI situations to think first pitch fastball. But it's a tough adjustment for Lucas right now. He's been so patient. I honestly like what he's doing. If he wants to go up there when no one's on base and take the first pitch, he can lull some of these pitchers into falling asleep. And then when RBI situation, then jump on the first pitch. Didn't do it there. Lucas. A little cut fastball here by Santiago. See the movement moving away from Duda. He will throw that changeup screwball inside and down to the left handed hitter. See, Duda has swung at the lowest percentage of pitches of any National League player. He's seen the most pitches per at bat of any player in the major leagues. Santiago's ahead of him, one and two. And he fouls off that screwball. Would you call that a legit screwball? Is that more of a changeup? It's, it's a, it's a changeup that he turns over. Certainly uh, doesn't have the downward movement that we would be accustomed to with Santiago. Because when he's got it working down in the strike zone, it has a lot of bite. Right now, he's hung a couple. Trying to get through the first inning unscathed. 
Two on and two out. And Duda watches wide. Two and two. Well, Santiago clearly has come out pumped up. He averages 92 with his fastball. It's been mostly 93 and 94 here in the first inning. It's kind of like when uh, Harvey faced Strasburg a couple of starts back. Don Cooper, the pitching coach for the White Sox, 2 2. And Duda got tied in a knot on that changeup, and he held back in time, and it's 3 and 2. Well, good pitch here by Santiago on that inside corner. Good call by Ayasonia. That was down and in. Yeah, Lucas stopped the swing in time. So now the runners will be moving. Murphy at second, right at first, set to go. 3 2 to Duda. Off speed, grinded slowly to Kepinger at second. And he throws out Duda to get Santiago through the opening inning. Mid strand a pair. Matt Harvey heads back to the mound for the second inning when we come back to City Field with no score. Inning, pitching and flushing. Well, the circle change, that is the key. See? The circle formed, and that's what you do with those three other fingers on top of the ball. And you watch his arm pronate. Look at that elbow lead, and then the flip over the forearm and the thumb and fingers. Um, you've got to be a strong person to do that over and over. Now, the second inning, Adam Dunn leads off against Matt Harvey and takes inside. And the Mets put on the full overshift against Dunn. If there ever was a shift needed for someone, this is the man. 412 career home runs, but another very slow start for Dunn, who drives one out to left center, cutting across Lagaris with Duda, and Duda makes the grab for the first down. Two years ago, Dunn had one of the worst years that any player's ever had. Last year, bounced back, didn't hit for a high average, but hit 41 home runs, and he threw over 100 walks. But it's been, uh, it's been a very slow go for Dunn this year. One out here's Connor Gillespie, former first round pick of the Giants, who finally gave up on him in this spring and made a minor league deal to send him to the White Sox. And the White Sox are glad they have him. Gillespie's been their best offensive player so far this year. Well, they said what makes him so attractive in this lineup when you look at him is he's the opposite of all the other hitters. He's a guy that makes contact. Got a short swing, puts the ball in play. He's hitting 291. The plan this year was for uh, Keppinger to play third base. Gordon Beckham's the regular second base, and he's hurt right now. So Keppinger's playing second, and Gillespie getting a shot. And uh, the way he's hitting right now, when Beckham gets back, he's going nowhere. <laughs> Gillespie out of Wichita State, first round pick by the Giants back in 08. 
That's playing him severely to the opposite field in the outfield. And a check swing foul one and two. It's those little things that happen in an at bat as you see Alexei Ramirez. It's a one one pitch you're fighting to get ahead as the pitcher. The hitter does a great job because Harvey missed his spot but it ticks the bat and now Harvey's in control. And Gillespie goes down on the 97 mile an hour fastball. Second strikeout for Matt Harvey. Well, he had thrown so many pitches inside by the time he goes outside with that good heat, no chance. So two out and nobody on. Now Alexei Ramirez, the Cuban born shortstop, hitting 271. In his sixth year with the White Sox, he takes a fastball for a strike. Well, when you check, check Matt Harvey. First inning, 10 of the 14 pitches were fastballs. He's had a kind of a constant theme. Good breaking ball there, slider. He's had a constant theme of trying to use his fastball in some starts and mixing in all of his pitches and others. This one has been mostly fastball so far, except that great slider early. He could switch later. 0 2 to Ramirez, and he goes outside with the slider, 1 and 2. Yeah, doesn't some of that depend on who you're facing? Who you're facing, how you're feeling, how it's coming out of your hand. Tyler Flowers, the catcher, would be next. 1 2, and Ramirez takes straight three call, 98 from Harvey. Six up and six down to start the night for Matt Harvey, his third strikeout. No score in the second. Score. Andrew Brown gets his first home at bat as a Met. His second start looking for his first hit was really tearing it up at Las Vegas before being called up and yet said did not enjoy hitting in Las Vegas. Too dry. Too dry. Too dry. He said uh, the, the, the dirt's too hard. You can't get a foothold in the batter's box. If the dirt's really hard it's really good for the hitter because the ball goes to the outfield quicker. Yeah, he's not a. Not a ground ball. Hitter. Oh, he says he's a gap hitter, and he says the gaps are really big in Las Vegas. He said some guys love hitting there, but we haven't heard a lot of positive about the Las Vegas well, experience. Come on, if you're batting three in a quich, take it. <laughs> Two and one to Brown. Twenty-eight years of age, out of the University of Nebraska. Here's like Davis on deck, and then Juan Lagares behind him against the 25-year-old lefty Hector Santiago. And that change up in the dirt, three and one. 
Interesting watching Santiago. The one thing he's done, and it's probably because he's too amped up, like you said, Gary, he's been telegraphing that change up, really speeding up his body, which has resulted in throwing that ball in the dirt. Yeah, Brown takes a rip, three and two. A third full count for Santiago already. Cost him 24 pitches to get through the first inning. Working around a base hit and a walk. Ball four and Brown draws a leadoff walk. So Santiago issues his second walk of the night. So that's a leadoff base runner and Kevin Burkhardt is standing by out at the uh, Verizon Center. Good news is I put in a request for you, Gary, with the mariachi band is walking away right now. So hopefully that'll come true in a couple of things. It is time for the Verizon Ask the Booth. Warren Chang is here. He's from Flushing. He could have walked here if he wanted to. But Warren has a question for you guys. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Uh, I actually won't hear your answer until later, but I do have a question. Uh, with all the games postponed from April, uh, there's a really brutal stretch of the schedule coming up. Uh, I think there's 30 games in 30 days in June and like five games in four days in Atlanta. Is there any thought being given to getting a, a pitcher up from AAA to have a six man rotation? Uh, Harvey. Yeah. <laughs> Wheeler. Wheeler. <laughs> it was good. I think we know where you're going you with that, Warren. Go ahead, guys. Hey, uh, Kevin, I dig the skinny tie, by the way. Uh, Warren, I'll try to yell so you can hear it. Um, <laughs> I, I think there is a good chance, but, uh, you know, I, I thought Terry Collins had the greatest line. When you heard a lot, of, you were talking about Andrew Bond didn't like hitting in Vegas, and and uh, Zach Wheeler was mentioning some things he didn't like about Vegas. And Terry Collins said, "You know what? Just pitch great, pitch great, and you'll be here." And uh, yes, I think you're right, Warren. With this middle of the season, it's just going to be so difficult. We have found out now on June 18th, the Mets are going to be playing a, a day-night doubleheader, five games in four days. No man's land down the line, and nobody can get to it. 0 oh and 2. Well, Zach Wheeler's put together two terrific starts in a row after a very rough beginning to his season. And you'd have to figure another couple of starts like the ones he's just authored, he's going to have a pretty good chance of being here. It's almost eerily similar to what you heard about Harvey last year after his first seven or eight starts. It was like, you know, he's pitching all right. He hasn't been getting his breaking ball over. He hasn't had great control. We've heard the same thing about Wheeler, and you're right. The last two have just been excellent. By the way, just talking about players not being happy with Las Vegas. There, there's a larger point to be made here, and, and you only have limited experience with this <laughs> because you didn't spend a lot of time there. But AAA in in the minor leagues is the one place that nobody yeah. wants to be, and it doesn't matter what city you're in, it doesn't matter what your circumstance is. You're close enough to the big leagues that nobody wants to be there. Well, there's two things working there. Not only are you close enough to smell the big leagues, but even worse, you have a lot of guys that have been brought down from the uh, big leagues, so they're uh, not feeling too good either. Doesn't matter who it is, whether it's yeah. the guy on the way down, the guy on the way up, the manager, the coaches, announcers, the announcers. <laughs> nobody wants to be there. They're all trying to be somewhere else. And the better you can negotiate the less than ideal conditions at AAA, the better chance you have of not being there anymore. I will tell you, uh, not being on those 6 o'clock uh, flights every morning after a night game is fine with me. Two and two to Davis. Three for his last 21. And Ike just got a piece of that change up to keep the at bat alive. It's been more than a struggle for Ike Davis through this early season. Watching the last week on TV, Ronnie, you see yeah. anything? Uh, this is what I'll say about uh, players that are good players. Mike Davis is a good player going through a bad stretch. You lose your confidence. You tell everyone around you you haven't. But when you lose your confidence, you get in between. When you're in between as a hitter, you're quick on the uh, late on the fastball and quick on the breaking ball. And that's what I see. Just a guy that has lost some confidence. You play in this market. You have to talk about it every single day. Um, that's just one of the perils and more difficult things of playing in this town. That's how it goes. So she went through the same thing for two and a half months last year before it finally kicked in. And when the bad April turns into the bad May, how do you avoid saying to yourself, well, here we go again? Well, and not not only that is uh, you have to answer the question and say, you know, would it be better if you went down and got a few bats in triple A? I mean, you ask me one player would say yes. They would never say yes to that. 
You see that lead 45 degree angle. And Davis goes down on the changeup. Well, you talk about a left hander is not afraid to throw chains up to left hand hitters. Santiago doing it a lot, and he gets his first strikeout. It, it's like watching a carbon copy of uh, Johnny Franco. I mean, the most famous changeup ever thrown by a left handed pitcher to Barry Bonds uh, was that inside changeup he got for a called third strike. Game. This one on a swinging strike from Davis. Game two in the 2000 Division Series out in San Francisco. So one out and one on. Here's Juan Lagares making his fifth start. Hitless in his last 13 at bats after his only big league hit. And he takes a curveball for a strike. Lagares playing center field, which he's done brilliantly so far, but still trying to figure it out offensively. One on and one out. And Lagares watches the fastball outside. Talking about imitation, we were talking about Johnny Franco and, and Hector Santiago. When I watch Lagares, you see Matt Harvey on deck. He looks a little bit like a young Manny Ramirez, the way he approaches it at the plate. Stylistically. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Stylistically, the way, you know, yeah. the way he stands, uh, the way he kind of leans in. Well, the Mets had a uh, a Manny Ramirez clone a few years back named Victor Diaz, who had some quick success before that disappeared. Off speed, fouled off, and it's two and two. Number five was his name? Um, was his number, was it? Might have been. Yeah. Pre uh, pre DW. He had a lot of power to uh, right center field. Well, the Mets, if nothing else, are forcing Hector Santiago to throw a ton of pitches early in this game. And Lagares breaks his back, grounds it to third. Gillespie adjusts and throws too late. His first thought was second base. But with Brown hustling down there, felt he didn't have the play, made the adjustment, and could not get Lagaris at first. Well, this is what you got to like the hustle on both ends. Andrew Brown getting that big lead that we showed to make Gillespie throw the ball to first base, and the great hustle by the young Lagaris just getting his foot in there before the ball's in the middle done. Second big league hit for Juan Lagaris. He can move. I mean, whenever your bat is shattered, you get out of the box a little slower. But picking him up and putting it down. Now, if you're Terry Collins, what do you do with Matt Harvey? One of the better hitting pitchers around. Most pitchers would be asked to bunt in this spot. If only to stay out of the double play, do you let him swing the bat? I think Matt's got to know before he gets to the plate and you see the defense. If they really pinch in, now remember, these are American League teams that don't play against a lot of bunts. If they really pinch in aggressively, swing the bat. If they don't, lay it down. He does lay it down. Flowers will have to go to first with it. And that was interesting from a bunt defense standpoint because the third baseman, Gillespie, barely took a step in. Well, I'll tell you what happens in the American League, and I could not believe it because I always thought I was a decent fielding pitcher. When I went to Oakland in the American League, they teach you over there getting out. They never want you to be aggressive in bunt defense. If it's laid down, they just want you to go to first base and you'll figure out how to get the, the third out. And this is very conservative here by the White Sox. Two to four on the sacrifice, first of the year for Harvey. So now two in scoring position for Ruben Tejada. Ruben flying to center his first time up, hitting 360 with runners in scoring position. Only David Wright has done better on the Mets ball club. So Santiago worked out of a two on jam in the first inning. Now will work out of the full windup with runners second and third. And gets the first pitch in for a strike. What was that pitch? That was just a little get me over slider. Hmm. <laughs> he does have uh, a repertoire. Ball and a strike to Tejada. Victor Diaz is a Met War 50 and 20. Hmm. You see the numbers for Ruben with runners in scoring position. And he takes a strike. 
And it's one and two. Mets left a pair in the first inning. Pulled down a third. The last be handles it cleanly and throws out to Hata and the Mets leave two again. No score after two. You associate blood more with hockey than baseball. And of course, that's where Matt spent his night last night watching his beloved Rangers. Right. But the uh, nosebleed appears to have been solved. And the White Sox now trying to solve Matt Harvey, who's retired the first six, striking out three of the six. Tyler Flowers leading off in the third for Chicago. And hits one toward the middle of the diamond. And right there is Tejada to field it. One away. So Flowers retired. And Dwayne Wise will hit number eight in the order. Well, we talked about what you use on a particular day so far. It's been the fastball. Well, I, I think that this is a smart pl uh, play also by Harvey because, you know, a lot of the White Sox hitters have not seen him at all. So it's a good to be very, very aggressive early in the game. Wise has been one of the few hot hitters in the lineup. He's basically a fill in right now. And he fouls it off. Your uh, regular lineup has Deaza playing center and Diane Viciedo playing left. So Wise is filling in for Viciedo. And he's 9 for 17 on this road trip, which has started in Texas, went to Kansas City where they got freezing rained out on Friday, had to play a makeup game yesterday. Not only the Mets who are affected by the weather. Well, they said also the weather in Texas was the coldest it's ever been. 40, so 44 game time. They've never had that before. It's been like that everywhere. Just awful. Better times ahead. Promise. <laughs> Just don't know when. Yeah. <laughs> Harvey ahead 0 and 2 on Wise, and the curveball fouled off. Well, let's. Talk about Harvey's fastball and how he's used it. Fastball percentage lower than it's been than it was earlier in the year. Certainly lower than it was last year in his early start. Remember that first start was one where it looked like he was just going to throw all fastballs in the in the game. In first Arizona. start of the year. And he struck out 11 yep. in his first start against the Diamondbacks. 
then they encouraged him to throw his change up more. Something we haven't seen much tonight. Here's the 0 2. And there's that change up. 1 and 2 to Y. Right on time, Gary. That's the breakdown for the season overall. Nice that bat by Wise here. He's one of those professional players. Two strikes. He's going to give you a two strike act. Try to make the pitcher work. Smart player. Again, the one two. And he comes inside with a slider and misses. Two and two. The only other time the Mets and White Sox have played was 11 years ago. Mets went to what is now U.S. Cellular Field, lost two out of three. Swing and a miss. He got him with a changeup. Fourth strikeout for Matt Harvey. Well, you have to love this pitch. Everyone in the building is going to know he's throwing a fastball, right? What does John Buck do? He counters on the 3 2 pitch with a little wiggle of the fingers for the changeup. Great call, great execution. Go sit down. So two out and nobody on now. Hector Santiago's second big league at bat. Of course, uh, these American League pitchers are always at a disadvantage coming to the National League Park. Santiago, a left hand pitcher, but a right hand batter, exposing his pitching arm, and he hits a weak ground ball to Murphy. And that's three perfect innings for Matt Harvey to begin his night. So Harvey right on cue. Mets come to bat at the bottom of the third with no score. This Sunday at City Field when the Mentos, the Pirates at 1 10 p.m. The Wiggles will also be performing two songs live prior to the game. Visit Mets.com slash the Wiggles for details and tickets. Maybe the biggest pregame concert since the Baja Met. <laughs> right now, let's go to Kevin Burkhart. Am I supposed to talk after that promotion? I'm not sure how to go after that. <laughs> the Wiggles are here, John. Did you know that? Uh, John is actually doing something great, actually, for to, to help uh, the relief for Hurricane Sandy ever since a 5K run July 13th. MLB's putting on the show, and there's a Team John Franco, right? That's Team John Franco. We're going to be doing it on uh, July 13th, Saturday. Uh, all the proceeds are going to go to the hurricane victims for Sandy. Uh, it's a 5K run in beautiful Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And uh, just come on out and have some fun. You could form your own team if you want. Uh, you could join my team, Team Franco, and all the proceeds are going to go to the Hurricane victims. Uh, good enough, John. You were uh, downstairs and talking to some of your old buddies today. You know, uh, Gary and Ronnie were talking about Robin Ventura and, and, you know, the leadership qualities that he had when he was here. But did you ever see this? Did you ever say, boy, when this guy retires, he's going to be a manager? You know, Robin was so quiet. You don't know, you don't know if he's hitting 340 or 240. And you don't know if you're winning 10 games in a row or losing. He had the same demeanor. And, and 
you know, I, I think, you know, he's a great manager. He could be a great manager because he doesn't get too high, too low, and he surrounded himself with some great coaches, all ex big league coaches right. who are helping him out. So uh, he surrounds himself with good people. He's working for a good organization, and he's having a blast doing it. He's well-loved in Chicago, and uh, he's got a pretty good team out there. How important is it, do you think, to, to be, you know, as relating to the to the everyday player today, maybe more important than ever, do you think? And, and Robin, obviously, you know, has, has played just a short time ago. Absolutely. I think it's very important, especially with Robin's background and uh, the history that he has playing the game. Uh, such a great third baseman. Uh, uh, total grand slams up there with grand slams. Uh, he's done everything that you could ask for as a player, and now he's bringing it over as a manager. And he told me his team is... You know, they're calm, whether they lose six or seven in a row or win seven in a row, they have the same demeanor. And that's a tribute to Robin. All right, what do you think uh, about Matt Harvey? What do you like? Well, you've been out here. What, what do you like about him the most? Well, this is the first time I've seen him pitch live, and uh, I've talked to Matt, and I've seen him on TV. I just think that he's very aggressive. Uh, he, he always wants to get better every time out there. And he's a future ace, if not the ace right now. Uh, and I just love everything about him, his demeanor. Uh, take the bull by the horns and go after it, and that's what you need out here. Hey, listen, you know, you're a New Yorker. You obviously played here. We're extremely successful here. What's going to be the biggest char challenge for Harvey, whether it's the huge successes going forward? David Wright gives one a lift. Doesn't seem like the ball is carrying just too well tonight. That one's caught and left. You know, whether it's the big successes, John, and dealing with all the, the media or, or some of the failures that, you're gonna, that he's going to face, what do you think is going to be the most difficult challenge going forward? I think the big thing for Matt is just keep the same demeanor, the same even keel. Don't get too high. Don't get too low. Don't, don't, uh, not too many off-field distractions. Make sure you just keep coming and do your work day in and day out. And obviously stay healthy. I Thank mean, you. and he's a great worker. He works. He's a workaholic. John, great seeing you. Okay. Don't forget, allstargame.com slash run for the run. On a July 13th. That was impressive. Good memory. John Franco. <laughs> I'm not that old now. <laughs> Pitching in more. Let's go back to you guys. And of course, that's the benefit. Uh, Superstorm Sandy Relief. By the way, John remembers when the Baja men played at I'm Shea. Sure, I'm sure he does. <laughs> that was before, uh, it was game four of the World was Series four? in 2000. Well, they won game three, didn't win again after the Baja men. John Buck pops one up. Rios in from right field to call. And makes the catch for the second out. By the way, when we showed Matt Harvey in the dugout, he has got a large something shoved up his left nostril to stem that uh, nosebleed. Yeah, you can see it a little bit better. So the trainers have worked their magic. Cut me, Mick. <laughs> So two on Murphy still at first by the way first time Murphy's been hit by a pitch this year only the sixth time in his career. He was due to ground it out to second base his first time up. By the way uh, Kevin's talk with John Franco brought to you by the City Alumni Association. That uh, all star 5k fun run. Saturday July 13th. Well, Mets past and present both helping out today Mike Baxter. Was in the Rockaways uh, raising money for uh, their rebound and uh, outstanding job by uh, Mr. Baxter helping out his fellow people in Queens. Duda takes the fastball outside from Santiago. That's left two on in the first inning, two more in the second. Got a leadoff base runner here in the third, but so far Santiago's been able to keep the Mets off the board. Not nearly as efficiently as Harvey has. Matt has not yet allowed a base runner. There goes Murphy, and the throw by Flowers had plenty of time, and Murphy's tagged out. So Daniel, who does not have a stolen base this year, gets thrown out for the second time. Two six on the caught stealing. No score as we go to the fourth.
White Sox with insider info and exclusive interviews. Plus, here the latest in New York sports as Chris Carlin and Adam Shine debate the top stories of the day on Loudmouth, presented by Caesars Atlantic City. Now at a new time, Monday at 5:30, only on SNY. Speaking of Chris Carlin, nice to have him in the building tonight, along with Bobby Ojeda doing the pregame show, competing with the mariachi band. Uh, talk, talk loud. Alejandro De Aza bluffs a button, takes a strike. De Aza fly to left to lead off the ball game. Matt Harvey going perfectly through the White Sox order first time around. De Aza started out with the Marlins back in 07. Takes inside. De Aza came up with Florida and I think it was his first game or second game crashed into the center field fence and Hurt his ankle? Yeah, it really derailed his career there, and it took him a few years to regain his footing. Good changeup by Harvey. Making good use of that now against the left hand hitters, and it's one and two. Second time around, also. Now Matt with the one two. Swing and a miss. He struck him out with heat. Five strikeouts for Harvey. One out of the fourth. Well, the fastballs have been that have struck out these Chicago White Sox hitters have been 95 plus after two changeups. Fastball up and in. And our second Cholula flamethrower of the night. I don't know, there was a 98 in there somewhere, wasn't there? Here's Jeff Kepinger flying to right his first time up. All the conversation about Matt Harvey and the extra rest and how it might affect his sharpness. I guess those questions have been quickly answered. Grounded down to right on the backhand and the off balance throw on a hop back. Out Davis with a nice pickup for the second half. Nicely done on both ends. A nice job by David surrounding this ball, getting it off quickly, given. Uh, Ike Davis, plenty of time to get down and low. Nice to see David. When you're doing the backhand, when you're receiving the ball in the backhand, you want to get your body as low as you can. Get your eyes right on the ball. See how he looked that into the glove? And same with Ike. He got his body real low so that the hop came right to his chest. So two out and nobody on for Alex Rios, and he tries to hold on the breaking ball and misses. Makes this play from the ball's off the end of the bat, so not a lot on it. So David's got to get enough on it. Yeah, Rios foul tips the slider, and it's 0 2. Rios struck out his first time up. One of five strikeouts for Harvey through the first three and two thirds. Here's the 0 2. Drive to right center. Closing ground, Lagaris. He steps in front of Brown and makes the grab. Four perfect innings for Matt Harvey. Mets will try and get on the scoreboard as we go to the bottom of the fourth.
We go to the bottom of the fourth inning. Lucas Duda, who was at the plate when Daniel Murphy was caught stealing to end the third, will come to bat. Very scary moment in uh, St. Petersburg. Jay Happ, the Toronto left-hander, hit by a line drive off the bat of Desmond Jennings and had to be carried off the field. I certainly wish Jay Happ all the best and hope that it is nothing terribly serious. Duda grounded out to second base his first time up. It'll be Duda, Brown, and Davis for the Mets at the bottom of the fourth against Hector Santiago from Newark, New Jersey. Up and in, and Duda couldn't stop the swing. One and one. Well, this fastball inside just rides up and in to Duda. Kind of foul tip, it looked like almost into the glove. Santiago's been in trouble in every inning, but the Mets have been unable to cash in. He's stranded four. Murphy was caught stealing. Pitch count high, but so far no runs against the lefty. As he slips that changeup low and in, and it's three and one to Duda. Andrew Brown waiting on deck. White Sox last year spent 126 days in first place. It wasn't until September 25th that they finally fell out for good. Lost 11 of their last 15 games to end the season. Overtaken by the Tigers, who won the American League Central. And now the White Sox off to a difficult start this year. 13 and 17, last place in the Central Division. And due to take strike three call. Second strikeout for Hector Santiago. Second consecutive 3 2 changeup out of the hand of Santiago. This one catches the outside corner. You'll see that it catches just enough of the plate. Well, maybe not. Looks, of course, with a good eye. So, one out here is Andrew Brown, who walked on a 3 2 pitch his first time up. The revolving door in the Mets outfield stopped. Did you see the catch Kirk Neuenheis made the other I, day? One of the best catches I've ever seen. And it was caused by that real short fence in right center. It reached all the way over the fence. His arm was in the bullpen and he brought the ball back. Snatched it. Unfortunately, Kirk's offense still is a problem. And that's why he's down in Vegas in the first place. One thing I will say about New and Heiss, and let's hope he, he finds his way. He said he didn't play for a whole month. You know, he didn't play entire spring training, didn't play for a month here with the big club. Starting over. Mike Davis on deck. Santiago ahead one and two. And Brown lifts one to right. Alex Rios is there. And there are two out. Well, Klondike brings us this date in Mets baseball history. It was May 7th of 1991. Daryl Strawberry, who had left the Mets as a free agent to go to the Dodgers, his first game back at Shea, homering against Frank Viola, but then retired by John Franco. He got one St. John's guy, but the other one got him. Mike Davis grounds one toward the middle and he has himself a base hit. So a two out single for Ike on a first pitch changeup. And the Mets have their third hit off Santiago. One struggling first baseman chatting with another <laughs> after Ike gets that base hit. Adam Dunn says to him, I haven't had too many of those. How about you? You know what's amazing to me is that Mike Davis is a tall athlete, large athlete. He looks small compared to Don. <laughs> Most people do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Ike's what, 6'4, yeah. 225, but Dunn is 6'6 six, six and 260. Oh. Here's Ligaris, who had an infield hit his first time up, and he takes the strike. Adam Dunn had Longhorns wishbone quarterback in his, uh, in his wish list as a kid. 
decided to go the other way and play baseball. Which would be unusual. Other than Vince Young, I always think of the quarterbacks for Texas as being kind of compact. The uh, the James Street type. Yeah. Houston Street's dad, who won a national championship for Daryl Royal back in the day. Oh, and two to Lagaris with the pitcher Harvey on deck. And the changeup got him. That's three strikeouts for Hector Santiago. So Harvey's being more efficient, but Santiago keeping up with him. No score after four. Plus, Bob Costas will be in studio to discuss being honored with the Vin Scully Lifetime Achievement Award from Fordham University on Daily News Live, presented by City tomorrow at 5 p.m. only on SNY. Well, so far, Matt Harvey's performance has been perfect. You see the fastball velocity just a tick behind Garrett Richards of the Angels and less than a mile an hour behind Strasburg. Watch Strasburg on TV Saturday. He does not look like himself. He, he uh, looks like to me he's fallen in love with his changeup. Uh, it seems like every other pitch is that pitch. Adam Dunn leads off and oh. takes a strike. That's again at the full overshift against Dunn, who never seems inclined to try and flick one to left field and get a single. He's just up there to walk or hit a home run. And he pulls one into the shift, and Tejada slides over to get it. Shortest throw he'll have to make the first base. One away. So Matt Harvey's retired the first 13. Let's check out Matt's signature pitch. Throw a, you know, two seam fastball. Um, you know, I'll work that into a righty, try and go away to a lefty. You know, it's really, uh, you know, the ground ball pitch. And then, um, you know, I pretty much short, you know, normal, normal four seam fastball. And, you know, as you guys seen, just rear back and let it fire. How, how do you have that, uh, as we like to say, rising ability? Because it does come at you. It looks like it jumps at the end. Is there anything particular to release point on that for you? I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I feel like I've always kind of had that, and and, and uh, you know, I, I guess it was something I was born with or, or whatnot, and, and you know, very thankful for the ability to do that. But um, I don't know. I just, you know, I I go with the old Nolan Ryan trick and and just throw. Throw as hard as I can. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good trick if you can do it. The beauty of keeping it simple, right? <laughs> Basing Connor Gillespie with one out and nobody on in the fifth. And he comes up and in with that let it go as hard as you can fastball. It's two and one. Gillespie struck out his first time up, one of five for Matt so far tonight. It took Matt 121 pitches to get through five and a third in his last start against the Marlins. Just 50 pitches through four and a third tonight. What a contract. 
Matt uh, was saying the other day that he could throw 120 pitches every start and he'd be perfectly comfortable with that. Not sure the manager or the folks above him <laughs> in the hierarchy would be happy with that. Three and, three and two now to Gillespie. In fact, uh, the highest pitch count average this year belongs to Justin Verlander at 114. Of course, he's the one to throw the most. Really quickly, two seamer, don't put your hands on the seam. Like Matt was saying, make sure they're inside the seam. And when he said four seams, make sure the horseshoe is right if you're right handed pitcher, right of your middle finger. Horseshoe, right of the middle finger. That'll make it jump a little bit. If you have, if you're Matt Hartley. Exactly. <laughs> three and two to Gillespie. Strike three call. Got him looking at the fastball at 97. Strikeout number six for Matt Harvey. Well, good call here by Dan Iasonia. It's a ball down in the strike zone. See it lifted just a bit by John Buck. Definitely catches almost most of the plate. It's just whether it was it high enough. So Harvey survives his first three ball count of the night. Two out and nobody on for Alexi Ramirez. And he hits one toward the middle of the diamond, but overcomes Tejada. Side retired. That's five perfect innings for Matt Harvey. 15 up and 15 down. Halfway through, no score at City Field. Radio 98.7 FM, Matt Harvey perfect so far. Six strikeouts, only 54 pitches through five. Matched in some degree by Hector Santiago, the young Newark native. Four scoreless innings as Harvey leads off the home fifth. Matt laid down a sacrifice bunt his first time up, his first of the year. Two hits and 12 at bats, lifetime 267 hitter. And he takes a rip at a fastball and it's 0 and 2. Harvey trying to pull a Kershaw there. Who won one nothing on opening day with a home run and a shutout. Ruben Tejada, Daniel Murphy to follow for the Mets in the home fifth. And Harvey goes down swinging on the fastball. Fourth strikeout for Hector Santiago. So one out and nobody on. Now Ruben Tejada comes up. Santiago has spent most of his professional career as a relief pitcher. He had one year in his minor league career. They made him a starter, but. And last year he was supposed to be the closer when the year began. That didn't work out for him. And now here he is making his second start of the year and matching zeros with Matt Harvey. And doing it against the team he grew up rooting for. So a special night for Harvey so far, but for Hector Santiago, he feels it's just as special. Tejada is flyed out and grounded out, and Ruben fouls off the first pitch fastball. Of 
Corners in against Tejada. It was ever thus against a guy who almost never bunts for a hit. Well, Hector Santiago left 150 tickets for today's game, and there is his mom and dad. They had to make the adjustment to White Sox garb. All that fans. Tejada floats one into shallow center. On comes Wise, then left to play it on a hop. And Tejada has the Mets' fourth hit of the night. A one out single. So one out and one on. Now Daniel Murphy has been aboard twice. Single to left in the first, and then was hit by a pitch in the third. Be interesting to see if Harvey throwing so well. Kind of push the envelope here. Maybe a hit and run. Something different. Be a nice time for it with Murphy, who makes good contact. All the miss. If he misses, it's hard for Tejada to steal the base. We've already seen Tyler Flowers' arm. He can really throw it. Gonna try and remember every moment from this. Hector and Lourdes Santiago. And a fastball strike to Murphy, one and one. To pick off that line drive for the second out. SN1 Super Slow Motion is brought to you by your Mercedes Benz Tri State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. Well, you know you're a good player when you got a pitcher who's pitching a good ball game. There's two outs, a guy in first, and the catcher, Tyler Flowers, wants to go out to speak to his young left hander. Well, the White Sox very much understand how dominant Matt Harvey has been so far, and one run might be enough to beat them. The way David's been swinging the bat, homework in three straight games, this is the guy you don't want to beat you if you're Hector Santiago. Right is walked and flight out to left, 0 for 1. And a change up taken outside for ball one. Not likely to get a fastball to hit this at that. You got Buck standing on deck who has 10 home runs this year, but he has cooled down relative to what Wright has done lately. Two and out. Santiago has walked two, he struck out four, he's hit a batter, allowed no runs and four hits. With 92 pitches in his first start last time out against Texas had been working out of the bullpen before that that was a ball Almost, wasn't it? Yeah, it was a balk. He tripped coming back off the mound stepping off the mound. They could have called it That would have actually made it easier for him then he just would have walked right What <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> to David He's almost laughing about it. You know he's got away with it Watch when he goes to step off see that's just a, a, a lot you have to have a more deliberate Move to that. Off speed, hammered to center field. Wise got a good break on this one. It makes it easy. Two putouts for Wise in the inning, and the Mets have turned aside again. A hit and one left. Matt Harvey has a lot of base runner. He goes back to the mound for the sixth.
to you by City. Welcome to City Tuesdays, where City credit and debit card holders enjoy savings and benefits at City Field. Learn more at Mets.com slash City Tuesdays. It's been only one tough play made behind Matt Harvey tonight, and that was David Wright circling in on a grounder by Jeff Keppinger right over the third base bag. Ike Davis pulled it out of the dirt. 15 up and 15 down for Harvey as Tyler Flowers leads off in the sixth in a scoreless game. And Flowers chasing the upstairs fastball, nothing at one. Flowers grounded out to short his first time up. Harvey's been very efficient, just 54 pitches through five innings. Because that was one of the issues coming into tonight, even with the extra rest after 121 pitches in his last start, how many would Terry Collins allow him to throw tonight? So far, the pitch count isn't even a hint of an issue. It's a good slider. It's one and two to Flowers. You know, Matt has something about him that is very unique for a guy who's a power pitcher. He seems to relish and enjoy having an eight pitch inning as much as he does striking out the side. One, two. Curveball, strike three call. He hasn't used that curveball much tonight, but he gets it. Over to get Flowers on strikes for his seventh of the night. Fastball up, fastball in, slider away, and then curveball to put you away. I mean, that's just not fair. <laughs> I mean, he has I mean, to see a pitch like that. He's thinking away, he's thinking slider away, and he gets a breaking ball right at him that freezes him. So one out and nobody on. Here's Dwayne Wise, who struck out his first time up, and Wright comes in on the grass to guard against the bunt attempt. I've watched Wise uh, play quite a bit, and when he bunts, he likes to bring that bunt towards Murphy, try to beat the pitcher to the bag. Breaking ball for a strike. And Wise cracks one deep in the gap in left center, but back goes Duda, and he runs again for the second out. As well struck a ball as the White Sox have had tonight. Two out of the sixth. Here's your Toyota tweet of the game, and it's not much for Doc Gooden to say other than string up the K's. <laughs> I think it's very interesting that Doc's getting involved in this. You know, it's almost like he's reliving his childhood. He's totally bought into yeah. the whole idea of Matt Harvey. And uh, so far, that's been exactly where he needs to be. Two out of nobody on. The pitcher is due up. That's uh, that's the next hitter, Alejandro De Aza, but the pitcher Santiago nowhere in sight. Well, this will happen when you have an American League pitcher uh, falls asleep. Forgot that he had to hit, probably. After all, they're not used to coming to the plate. Now the, the crowd is booing because they feel as though this is the White Sox exercising some gamesmanship against Harvey, but that's not it at all. Uh, this is just a brain cramp. Uh, we can see Santiago point to himself, saying, "My bad." My bad. Just completely forgot that he was supposed to hit. <laughs> so he comes jogging up to the plate. Harvey's retired 17 in a row. He got Santiago in a ground ball his first time, and he hits the first pitch foul. I was just going to say, if he hit that first pitch for a hit, you feel like tackling him on the way to first base. <laughs> well, he didn't even throw him a fastball. He threw him a slide, and he fouled it off. He has a fastball for a strike, and quickly it's over two. No runs, no hits, no base run for the White Sox tonight. One and two to Santiago. Hector's <laughs> got a big smile on his face. Again, a one two. It's a pretty good hack and fouls off the fastball. Kid has now had two major league at bats under his belt. Well, I was talking to Cy Young Award winner Steve Stone in their television booth, and he was saying that Santiago's an outstanding athlete. Struck him out. Eight strikeouts in six perfect innings for Matt Harvey.
Well, it's been a heck of a night for Matt Harvey, but it's also been a great night for Hector Santiago of the White Sox. Gary and Ronnie have been talking. Local guy, grew up in Newark, Bloomfield Tech in Bloomfield, where he was a star there. Played on a good team. His brother Anthony was his catcher, who now, ironically, is also in the White Sox system. He also played with Burt Reynolds, not the actor, but Robinson Cano's cousin, who's now playing independent ball. He is, as Gary pointed out, a huge Mets fan. How so? Yeah, he loved John Franco, but he brought his Dwight Gooden jersey to the game tonight in hopes that maybe Gooden would be here and he can get his autograph. Gooden, of course, is not here tonight, but that's the kind of guy he is. He's a hardworking guy. His dad is a floor installer. He used to take him to work all the time and then to his fast pitch softball games. So he not only learned hard work, learned how to play from his dad. Good stuff from Hector Santiago, guys. John Buck fouls one off the right side. Well, Doc would sign the uh, sign the autograph by tweet if he could. <laughs> we don't have that technology yet, Gary. <laughs> It'll happen. There's a good doctor. Well, Santiago just trying to keep pace with Matt Harvey. Just thinking that Santiago's teams, of course, would be the 99 and 2000 sure. teams. Including Joe McEwing and <laughs> Robert Ventura. Buck is flying to center, flying to right, 0 for 2 tonight. And that's for time. Buck, Duda, and Brown trying to get the Mets on the scoreboard at the bottom of the sixth. Because no matter how many in a row Matt Harvey retires, he needs a run. Reminds me of a game that Tom Seaver pitched in Wrigley Field, where he held the Cubs hitless for nine innings, but the Mets never scored. And you lose all your friends when you're working on this type of game. I should say he held the Cubs hitless into the night, but the Mets didn't score. Swing and a miss, and Buck is out on strikes. That's five strikeouts for Hector Santiago, one shy of his season high. Let's check in with the studio. Gary Apple standing by with this game break. Second game from McCann off the disabled list, but 0 for 4 last night. They used Evan Gaddis in left field and moved Justin up to right. We've been speculating over the weekend how Gaddis would be used with McCann's return, and that was Freddie Gonzalez's first move. McCann, by the way, in that video we just showed, looked like he lost a little weight yeah. while he was on rehab. Probably a very good thing for his longevity. Simmons last night had a couple of home runs. Well, he's going to be a star. Oh. Andrew Brown waiting on deck. So now Judas in front of the count, 2 and 0. Oh. Might be a place to look for a pitch to drive. But he misses the fastball. It's 2 1. Lucas is grounded out, taking a call third strike, 0 for 2. Well, it may not be perfect, but it's a pretty good line for Hector Santiago. 92 pitches deep in his night. There's every chance this is going to be his last inning. See how far Robin Ventura wants to push him. Only his second start. 92 pitches his first time out. He came out in the sixth inning of that game against Texas. Strike three call. Duda goes down looking on the fastball. And Santiago with back to back strikeouts to start the sixth. Well, the 2 0 pitch, he went out of the strike zone and then took two fastballs right there. So two out of nobody on now Andrew Brown who's walked and flied out. That's got two men on in the first inning. They got runners to second and third in the second inning. They've had base runners in every inning but this one. And a good cut by Brown nothing in one. Andrew looking for his first hit as a Met. Hit two home runs in Las Vegas this year more of a line drive hitter than a home run hitter. Although he had five for Colorado last year. Here's the very slow breaking ball for a strike, and it's 0 2. Santiago does a nice job of straightening up with the fastballs inside, taking that change up away. Here's the 0 2. This is with the fastball. Two 
two to Brown. Again, Santiago's reading the papers. He knows who he's facing. He knows that Matt Harvey is making his mark. I'm, he's a young pitcher, too. He's trying to make his mark tonight. This is only his sixth career start, Santiago. Harvey's 17th big league start. Blue number off the end of the bat. Santiago down to field it. And that retires the side. First one, two, three inning of the night for Hector Santiago. Now Matt Harvey has been perfect so far. Heads back to the mound for the seventh. There was concern going into this start that Matt Harvey might not be sharp. He's been as sharp as the edge of a razor. 18 up and 18 down. Third time around the batting order now as we go to the seventh. Alejandro De Aza takes a curveball for a strike. De Aza's fly to left and struck out. Harvey has struck out eight. And he's throwing every pitch out of the windup. Wright comes in on the grass at third. And Deaza watches the changeup outside, one and one. Jeff Kepinger to follow, then Alex Rios, a couple of right hand hitters behind the left hand swinging Deaza. Doesn't matter left or right tonight for Harvey. Two balls and a strike. The hardest hit ball was off the bat of Dwayne Wise in the sixth, a drive to left center that Duda ran down. The toughest play was on a Kepinger grounder that David Wright made a nice play on in the fourth. Two and two now to Deaza. Former Met farmhand Matt Lindstrom, part of a hard throwing White Sox bullpen, is the first man to get up. Two two to Deaza. He pulls one foul, slider, blowing in. Well, there's many ways to go here. He can come back, bust him in with the fastball. He can throw that changeup away that he's used effectively against the Aza. Buck wants the fastball. Struck him out. Nine strikeouts for Matt Harvey. One out of the seven. Well, earlier Kevin was talking to Matt Harvey. He was talking about that high riding fastball that rises in the strike zone. And he's got it right now. Said I've always been able to do that. I'm happy for that gift. The gift that keeps on giving is Jeff Kepinger, 0 for 2. And 
Kepinger hits a ground ball to Tejada at short. Two out. Well, Kepinger's last at bat was as close as the White Sox have come to a base runner tonight. Well, nice plays at both ends by Wright and Davis. Secured that out for Harvey. Remember Kepinger's first at bat of the ball game. Just missed one foul down the right field line. 20 batters, 20 retired for Matt Harvey. Now he faces the number three hitter, Alex Rios, who struck out and flied out. And he takes a strike at 97. And that has not thrown more than 14 pitches in any inning. He threw 14 of the first inning. Here he is, two out of the seventh, only 73 pitches. Ground ball toward the hole. Tough play for Zahad on the backhand. And the jump throw, not in time. And the perfect game is broken up on an infield single for Alex Rios with two out in the seventh. And 20 down. And with two out of the seventh, Alex Rio sits one just far enough away from Tejada that he's able to beat it out. Well, he did everything he could, got enough on the throw, just the speed of Rios, beats it pretty easily. Mark Carlson with the call at first, the proper call. And now Harvey pitches out of the stretch for the first time tonight. Here's Adam Dunn. And he takes the change up low. Pretty good slider away. Matt Harvey lets you know. What happens on that play? He gave it the Colorado look. <laughs> oh well, got to get the next batter. Buck comes up ready to throw, but Rios wasn't going anywhere. You know, I was thinking that if Rios had been retired, would it be a time if Dunn led the eighth inning off to bunt the baseball? Well, some will say baseball protocol precludes the bunt attempt when a no hitter is in force. Not in a 0 0 game, it doesn't, in my estimation. Now, Harvey behind for a rare time tonight, and Dunn fouls it away. Ball game very much on the line. Back when uh, Seaver threw his imperfect game against the Cubs in 69, Randy Hundley led off the ninth inning and tried to bunt for a base hit. But I think the protocol on those things has changed over the years. A player who tried to do that in the late innings now would uh, feel, feel a lot more heat. Well, the hardest thing here is the deflation you feel, pitching out of the stretch for the first time, and facing a guy who's a you never know kind of hitter. Make a mistake. Two runs are on the board. 412 lifetime home runs for Adam Dunn. 2 2 from Harvey. Struck him out. Number 10 for Matt Harvey. The perfect game and the no hitter gone. But a gem nonetheless through seven for Matt Harvey. 10 strikeouts. A nothing, nothing game.
for his turn at bat as Ike Davis leads off in the home seventh in a scoreless game and takes a breaking ball low and away. And that are Harvey coming off to a big ovation when he finished the top of the seventh. Now his teammates can talk to him. I'd rather they don't. <laughs> so would he. <laughs> Ike has one of the Mets four hits, a single up the middle in the fourth. Harvey do up third in the inning and a slow ground ball plenty of time for Ramirez to charge and make the toss low throw handled nicely by Dunn and they get Davis for the first out. Dunn not known for his defense at first base made a nice scoop there. Well, nice play by the Cuban missile he's called Alexi Ramirez and you're right nice play by Dunn. Round up, as Keith always says. So one out and nobody on. Here's Juan Lagares, who picked up his second big league hit, a broken bat infield hit in the second, struck out in the fourth. So the no hit bid by Matt Harvey gone, and now Hector Santiago continues his shutout bid in just his fifth big league start, sixth big league start. And a good changeup. He's had that all night long, and it's ahead on Lagares 0 and 2. The one two from Santiago and Lagares with a good cut fouled back the fastball. You know, pitchers come in all shapes and sizes. There's three things you got to have the ability to throw your fastball, four strikes to both sides of the plate, the ability to throw a breaking pitch behind in the count, and the heart of the line. Those are the three things you need. Strike three call got him looking at the curveball. Lagares is out. Seven strikeouts for Santiago, a season high. And now Matt Harmon. Matt has sacrificed and struck out tonight 0 for 1. Still looking for that Kershaw moment. <laughs> Might be a night where Matt has to help himself. Santiago still throwing hard. 109 pitches deep. Sixth career start coming. In flushing against the team he grew up rooting for, and he has been every bit the ace to match Harvey tonight. Now the one two, and the changeup got him. Side retired. Eight strikeouts for Santiago. He's retired eight in a row. Scoreless going to the eighth.
dealer, visit CadillacTriState.com to search local offers and find a dealer near you. By Bob's Discount Furniture, proud to be the furniture store of the New York Mets. And by Nissan, sign and drive today only during Nissan sign and drive events. Shop at ChooseNissan.com. Well, Hector Santiago being congratulated for a job well done. Coming home to the New York area and throwing seven scoreless innings tonight against the Mets. He's making sure he gets the high fives from everybody. Now Matt Harvey tries to continue on his quest. He's never thrown more than eight innings in a major league game. He's certainly positioned to do that and more tonight. Allowing just one hit through the first seven innings. Connor Gillespie's 0 for 2, struck out twice, swings at the first one and flies it out to Duda in left field. One pitch and one out for Harvey in the eighth. By the way, Harvey's bid for perfection tonight, six and two-thirds perfect, the longest perfect bid by a Mets since Rick Reed against the Tampa Bay then Devil Rays in 1998, which was also six and two-thirds, broken up with two out of the seventh on a double by Wade Boggs. Wow. So 15 years between perfect bids that long. Alexi Ramirez thinks about a bunt and takes a strike. Ramirez took a call third strike in the second, grounded out to short in the fifth. The White Sox no runs and one hit. The Mets no runs and four hits. Reached four and foul. Nothing in two. You now we showed the picture of Santiago who destined to seem like he's out of the ball game. Betrayed by the pitch count. He's throwing better now than he was in the first two innings. He threw 111 in his seven innings. Harvey is throwing far fewer. 0 2, and Ramirez with a late swing foul. You know, the uh, the only White Sox hit came on a, an infield single by Rios, but if you look at the four Met hits, none of them was struck particularly hard either. Murphy's first inning single, probably the best hit among them. Ball foul. Matt Lindstrom up again. The White Sox pull back in, ready to pitch the bottom of the eighth. So now, young Mr. Santiago can only hope his team could find a way to scratch him a run. 0 2. Little tapper. Murphy has to come in. And a close play, got him. Murphy almost took too long, but he throws on Ramirez for the second out. This is one of those that kind of sticks in your glove, and Murph couldn't get it out quick enough and barely gets Ramirez, who has great speed. Sometimes that's a case of not knowing your opponent and how quick Ramirez is. So two out and nobody on for Tyler Flowers who's grounded out and struck out 0 for 2. Talk about efficiency. No more than 14 pitches in any inning. Fly ball right field should be easy for Andrew Brown. Matt Harvey with eight scoreless innings matches his longest outing in his big league career. He's allowed just one hit, still no score.
Hawks have done here at City Probables for tomorrow. Jeremy Hefner coming off back to back terrific starts. Goes against Jake Peavy, who has been battling back problems, but is pinned in for tomorrow's start. Sort of a scratch twice in a week. Back spasms, right? He's been suffering from, as you see, Matt Lynch will come in, 33 years old, well traveled. One of the few ball players you'll see from Idaho turned out a full scholarship of University of California, Berkeley, to sign with the Mets. Top of the batting order, Ruben Tejada up for the fourth time. Single to center his last time up. One of four hits for the Mets tonight. And Lindstrom fires a fastball in for a strike. Well, the Mets couldn't do much for seven innings against Hector Santiago. No runs, four hits, two walks, eight strikeouts for the young left hander from Newark. You know, for a high pitch count, seven innings. You know, they say 50's the new 40. Seven's the new nine. That's almost like a complete game nowadays. Well, especially for a guy who began the season yeah. in the bullpen. It's only his second start. He threw 111 pitches. Lindstrom has bounced around a lot the last few years after leaving Florida. A hit 0 and 2, and he throws the slider. And Tejada missed it and is tagged out. By Flowers. Don't know why Ruben didn't run. He was trying to fake that he fouled the pitch off. But you're right, if the ball goes away, he should run. He did not touch it, just kind of boxed there by the catcher, Tyler Flowers, who retrieves it and applies the tag. I think one of the hardest things to do for a relief pitcher is to come in after a guy has stymied the opposition because I don't know, I think there's a, a feeling from the opponents that, and the Mets in this case, Boy, we couldn't do anything against Santiago. Let's do something against someone we've seen a lot right. in Matt Lindstrom. And that is a, a bit of an advantage for the Mets, although they haven't done much against him. David Wright has good numbers and he's on deck. Murphy tonight, one for two, lined out to center field his last time up. Probably the hardest hit ball against Santiago all night. No score, bottom of the eighth, as Lindstrom misses away. Since leaving Florida, Lindstrom's gone to Houston, Colorado, Baltimore, and Arizona. That's all in the last three years. And now bouncing to the south side of Chicago. Wright waits on deck. And Murphy gets jammed. It'll pop up into shallow center, and on comes Wise. He's caught him in every direction tonight. Two out. Drive around the majors presented by Cadillac. Milwaukee got five in the first inning and leading Texas five to one. Brian McCann, his second game back from the disabled list, couple of RBIs. That game's now in the fifth with the Braves up 4 1 on the Reds. And uh, Alan Craig with a home run. The Cardinals up early on their arch rivals, the Cubs, 1 0. And how about the Houston Astros down 3 0 against the Angels? 6 3 Houston in the third. Try the nightmare in Los Angeles. Or Anaheim, anyway. Well, both sides of the Southern California morass. Here's Wright with two out and nobody on. David is four for 11 against Lindstrom in his career. All for two and a walk tonight. And a ground ball for Ramirez to handle it short. So Lindstrom comes in and throws a 1 2 3 bottom of the eighth on to the ninth Harvey back to the mound with no score.
And three players who share the club record for the most six RBI games in men's history with three six RBI games in men's history which three players had three six RBI games. That's confusing. <laughs> Nate Jones gets up in the Chicago bullpen as we go to the ninth and for the first time in his 17 big league starts Matt Harvey will throw a pitch in the ninth inning. Dwayne Wise will lead off for Chicago. The 87 pitches through eight for Harvey who's allowed just one base runner all night. Wise takes wide for ball one. An infield single by Alex Rios with two out of the seventh inning. The only base runner for Chicago. And the changeup misses and Matt for a rare time tonight behind 2 0. Jordan Danks, who hit a game winning home run for the White Sox yesterday in Kansas City, is on deck to bat for the pitcher. There's a strike two and one. There's Danks, the brother of White Sox pitcher John Danks, was on the disabled list. And Wise hits it in the air to right. Andrew Brown has it measured. One out. SNY Super Slow Motion brought to you by your Mercedes Benz Tri State dealers. Visit them on the web at searchmercedes.com. Gary, this is one of those evenings uh, that's a city field evening where the ball's really not traveling tonight off the bat. It's what we usually see early in the season, but really wasn't the case for much of April. The ball was really flying out of here. So here is Danks. So after a base running misadventure in the ninth inning yesterday getting tagged out between third and home hit the home run of the 11th inning to win it for the White Sox yesterday against Kansas City. That's Chris Sale on the right their outstanding left hander starter. He made the start yesterday for the White Sox Had they not had that makeup game to play Sale probably would have pitched tonight. But Jake Peavy had to be scratched Sale got moved up to Monday. And so it was Santiago tonight. He could not have been much better. Thanks. Swinging at the high fastball, one and two. Again, that life upstairs is one of the things that is the trait of the fastball of Matt Harvey. Harvey has struck out ten. Just missed with that slider, two and two. I'll tell you one thing. I rate the umpires in my own book. But Dan Iasoni always gets the biggest grades, highest grades. He doesn't miss too many pitches. Now Harvey goes to a three ball count for only the second time all night. He went three and two on Gillespie in the fifth and struck him out. Scott Rice up in the bullpen. Three two to Danks. Got him. A 3 2 changeup. 11 strikeouts for Matt Harvey, matching his career high. Well, we've seen two changeups for strikeouts tonight, and this one a little high in the strike zone, but the hitter has to be thinking fastball, starts it early, and then is fooled. Harvey struck out 11 in his first big league start in Arizona last July, and now he has 11 strikeouts to match that tonight. Two out and nobody on. Now Alejandro Daza. It was 0 for 3, struck out his last two at bats. Thinks about a bunt, bringing right in from third, 1 and 0. Now Bobby Parnell getting loose. Harvey's only at 99 pitches. Probably cut him off after nine, but there's no reason he couldn't pitch beyond the ninth if necessary. Now he's behind Diaz at 2 0. Now a foul ball on the fastball, 2 and 1. Just the little traces of being tied hit behind some hitters for the first time. Addison Reed, who is the White Sox closer, is on your right. And Nate Jones on your left. 2 and 1 to Diaz. And a change up for a strike. That was an interesting note we just put up on the graphic. It's been 18 years since a Met pitcher went beyond nine innings. Bobby Jones in 1995. 
That's a hoping that won't be necessary. Hoping Harvey gets through the inning and then they get him a run in the bottom of the night. 2 2. Line foul. Probably sitting at home and saying, why can't he keep going? The one thing about pitching in these 0 0 games is 101 pitches he's thrown, but tension filled each and every one. He retired the first 20. And after one hiccup, he's retired the last six. 2 2. Inside. So he runs back to back full counts to Danks and now to Deaza. Good breaking ball here, just a little low and inside. Three two. Deaza keeps the battle alive. He got Danks on a three two changeup. One thing you'll see on pitchers. When they get a little tired, I'm not saying Harvey's tired, but getting to the end, your breathing gets a little bigger. Lots of shakes here on Deaza, who asked for time. Dead red. Did he go? They check a third. He struck him out. A career high 12 strikeouts for Matt Harvey. Nine shutout innings, only one hit allowed. And now the Mets will try and win it for him in the bottom of the ninth. Of his 17 major league starts, this has been the most dominant of Matt Harvey's career. Nine innings, one hit, no walks, 12 strikeouts. Now, is it enough? Nate Jones pitches the bottom of the ninth for the White Sox. He had a big year for them last year, went 8 and 0 oh with a low ERA. The only thing, he does walk people, control issues for Nate Jones. John Buck is 0 for 3 tonight. And he takes that pitch high. And quickly, Jones is behind 2 and 0. Oh. Hector Santiago went the first seven for the White Sox. No runs, four hits, eight strikeouts. Matt Lindstrom pitched a one, two, three, eighth. And now Nate Jones in the ninth. Bucks sitting fastball, grounds one down to third. And Velasquez throws him out one away. Mm -hmm. 
well. Would you send Matt Harvey out to the 10th? There's nobody throwing right now in the Mets bullpen. It's been 18 years since a Mets pitcher worked in the 10th inning. He's thrown 105 pitches through nine. Well, Parnell's easing out there right now. I saw the legs of Bobby. I have a feeling that given the 121 that Matt threw in his last start, he's not going to get the chance to pitch the 10th. There he is. Mets are hoping to make that a moot point with Lucas Duda at the plate. Lucas is 0 for 3, struck out his last two at bats. Wait, Jones really shows you the ball. Unusual he? motion from Jones, almost like Zen and the art of archery as he pulls that arm back and gets it in the slot and ready to go. And gets the breaking ball over for a strike. One and one. Andrew Brown on deck. That was an important laying off of that pitch by Lucas Duda. Should get a pitch to hit here. Ahead in the count. Two one. Driving the air to right field. Chasing Rios back a few strides. And that's the second out. Two out. Let's answer our AT&T trivia question. The three players who've had six, three RB, three six RBI <laughs> games in Met history. He knew it was going to be harder. <laughs> Robin Ventura, one of the three. David Wright and Dave Kingman are the others. He knew Robin had to be one of the answers, right? All those grand slams. Well, now Jordani Valdespin will bat for Andrew Brown. Mets are looking for that. Now the speed magic off the bench. Six career pinch hit home runs, including one this year. The three run shot that he hit in Miami to help the Mets win the last game of that series. He's become the secret weapon for the Mets, almost like keep him on the bench so he has this mano a mano confrontation every night. Well, it might be Matt Harvey's only chance to win this game is for Valdespin to connect. Right now. Facing 27 year old Nate Jones. And he takes a fastball for a strike. That is a hard pitch low in the strike zone. You mentioned, Gary, they have some fantastic arms coming out of that White Sox bullpen. Now the speed cracks one foul. Jordan has already hit a walk off home run this year, not as a pinch hitter. Hit the grand slam against the Dodgers that won a game for the men. Listen, not that you wouldn't want that to happen, but that's not the thought you should have. He's got speed. Get on the base somehow. Steal second. Base hit brings you in. Mike Davis would be next. Matt Harvey, a very interested spectator. Now the speed bounces one foul and slider in on his hands. It's an interesting situation. Here to hit the ball. Out of the yard again. He might not ever get another start. <laughs> Cementing himself <laughs> into that bench roll. 0 2 from Jones. That's too high. Another hard thrower. Lefty Matt Thornton gets up in the White Sox bullpen. 1 2. Dallas being fouls off the fastball to keep himself alive. What pitching we've seen tonight. Matt Harvey at his absolute brilliant best. But the kid from Newark had Hector Santiago good enough to keep pace. On the Autobahn tonight, no one's under 90. Everyone that comes in throws harder. One, two. Now the speed goes down swinging and we're going to extra innings. Nine innings not enough for Matt Harvey. Mets and White Sox scoreless as we head to the 10th at City Field.
Sandy now back on track. The SNY Play Bowl Award helped the Copake Youth League recover from a storm with a $5,000 grant. If you're in a league from the tri-state area in need of assistance, apply for the SNY Play Bowl Award presented by New York Community Bank at facebook.com slash SNY. Rudani Valdes being a pitch. It stays in the game in right field. Mets uh, bring Bobby Parnell in and bring him in straight up so his turn is due in the next inning. So it looks like Terry Collins only wants one inning for Bobby. Well, you know, in these uh, tight games, you like to bring in your closer at home. Jeff Keppinger leads off in the 10th inning. So Parnell takes the mound for the 10th after Matt Harvey pitched nine completely dominant innings. He allowed just an infield single, the only base runner against him. He struck out 12. Other than throwing a perfect game, it's hard to imagine a pitcher being more dominant than Matt Harvey was tonight. No walks, no strikeouts. What do you have? Three, three ball counts, maybe four tops. No one got the second or third. On and on. Struck out the last two hitters to face him to keep it a scoreless game in the ninth. Kappinger's 0 for 3. But then again, isn't everybody? <laughs> two and one. Rios and Dunn to follow. Remember that the White Sox have the big bat of Paul Canerco sitting in their dugout. Canerco out of the lineup with the DH not in play. Slow ground ball for Tejada. Has to play the in between hop and throws him out. So Kepinger retired, one out, and now Alex Rios, who has the only hit for the White Sox tonight. Kind of a slider off the end of the bat. And you can see Tejada did just about everything you could do. Just Rios, great athlete, great speed. A very close play at first, but the right call by Mark Carlson as Rios beat it out with two out of the seventh, the only base runner for the White Sox tonight. And Rios hits one foul down the right field line. There's a phrase when you pitch a game like Matt Harvey has pitched, you come back in the Dug out or the clubhouse, and you get a hang with him, kid. Never want to hear that, ever. I mean, as a pitcher, you can't do your job any better than that. You've done everything that you've been allowed to do. The only thing he could do better would be to go out for the tenth, but that wasn't his choice. Well, he got a sack bunt down. They had that one chance. I guess he could have hit the home run. That would have been the only thing he could have done better. We'll work on that in year three. <laughs> I don't know. Year two is still pretty early. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> Parnell ahead on Rios, 0 and 2. Parnell last pitched on Friday night when he came in in the ninth inning with a winning run at third base and got two huge outs there. That's the line on Harvey. Gets him on the breaking ball in the dirt. Rios down on strikes. Two out of the ten. It's not only that knuckle curve has gotten sharper and tighter, but he also has learned how to put it in the dirt when he has to, when he's ahead in the count. Adam Dunn is 0 for 3. Flight out, grounded out, struck out. The men outfielders are playing with their heels on the warning track <laughs> against Dunn in this spot. I mean, you can't play an outfield defense any deeper. And of course, the infield overshifted. This is a situation where you'd love him to bunt. You know, I was thinking that if he had uh, retired Rios uh, instead of that infield single, Dunn would have led off uh, the eighth. It would have been interesting if he would have chosen the bunt. Moot point now. Cornell quickly ahead of the over two. By the way, the Mets have had 37 one hitters in their history, including combined one hitters. They've only had one extra inning one hitter. That was by Terry Leach, who pitched all 10, 10 innings, innings against the Phillies in 1982. I remember that game. That was that great year by Terry. What, uh, what 10 and 1 that year? 10 or 11 and 1. And in that game, which was in uh, Philadelphia. John Denny pitched for the Phillies. He allowed just one hit in nine innings. So you talk about your great pitch games on both sides, like we've had tonight. One, two to Dunn, up and in. Of course, the greatest 
pitch game if you take both pitchers performances of all time came in 1965 when Sandy Koufax threw his perfect game against the Cubs and the opposition pitcher Bob Henley for Chicago pitched a one hit. Three two. Of course. We're only talking about major leagues now not talking about college games. Lucky didn't have them now they'd be in that tape room until three o'clock in the morning. Three and two to done. And he struck him out. One, two, three, go the White Sox in the tenth. A couple of strikeouts for Parnell. That's 14 for Met pitchers who have allowed just one hit through ten. Still no score. Bottom of the 10th inning in a scoreless game. Mike Davis leads off against Nate Jones. Mike has one of the Mets' four hits tonight, a single to center back in the fourth. Jones pitched a 1 2 3 ninth, and Davis takes a fastball outside. It'll be Davis, then Ligaris, and then the pitcher spot. It's Roy Hawkins, next man up in the Mets' bullpen. After Bobby Parnell pitched a dominant inning in back of Matt Harvey. Well, if Alvespin had gotten on, Fortin would have came in the left-hander to face Ike Davis. Did not. Ventura has countered by sending Jones back out there. You would think a easier mark than Thornton for Ike Davis. Mike Baxter ready to pinch hit. Off-speed pitch for a strike. Two and one to Davis. Mets had their chances in the early innings of this game. Got two men on in the first, got runners at second and third in the second. Didn't score either time. They've added a runner in scoring position since. Davis takes a big hack and it's three and two. Full count pitch and it's too high and Davis draws a lead off walk. Let's see if the Mets pitch run for him carrying that winning run. Back goes sports night tonight after the post game. Rafael Montero for the Binghamton Mets pitching in Trenton. Knicks try to even their series with the Pacers and the Islanders in action as well. Geico sports night tonight after the post game right here on SNY. Don Cooper the White Sox pitching coach on the phone. Well, Davis is going to stand to run for himself. Juan Magaris, he would have to think, is going to lay down a punt here. 
Lagaris one for three and infield hit back in the second. That's up one sacrifice tonight that came from Harvey and soft toss by Nate Jones after Lagaris had already squared. Well very slow at first base Adam Dunn not taking any chances not usually very aggressive. That's where the bunt has to go. And Lagares takes a fastball strike. Thought the pitch was low. Looks back at Dan Iasonia. You ask these players that come up from Triple A to see Thornton in the bullpen at bat third, fourth, and fifth in the lineup uh, to bunt. Sometimes you get indifferent results. Baxter on deck to pinch hit. That's why the lefty is up, but the Mets have Turner waiting in the dugout and Bird as well. So you have to think if they bring the lefty in, the Mets will go to one of those two rather than Baxter. And that's what Robin Ventura has to consider if he makes the pitching change. Oh, and one to Lagaris, and he gets the bunt down nicely. Gillespie will make the throw to first. 5 3 on the sacrifice, moving the potential winning run to second. Oh, a nice job by the young Lagaris. You can see pitching in from third is Gillespie. No, even. Try to come in from Dunn and nice bunt by the youngster. So Baxter's announced that the game is a pinch hitter. Let's see if Robin Ventura brings in the lefty or if he leaves Jones in there. Of course, he can always walk Baxter here and go instead after Tejada to get the righty righty matchup. No score, bottom of the 10th, and they're going to leave the righty in and they will pitch to Baxter, who's had a terrific run as a pinch hitter both last year and this. Trying to pick up Davis with the winning run. And Ronnie, I don't understand why you wouldn't pitch run for Davis at this point. I was wait till you finish, Gary. I was thinking the same thing. You have to pinch run for Davis. He's just too slow. Get someone on there who's got some wheels. They don't play very deep in the outfield against Baxter, who doesn't have a whole lot of power. So it might be hard to score on a base hit to the outfield. You got Bird sitting on the bench. You could run better than Davis. Deaza in left field does not have a great arm, but accurate in center field wise. Fantastic arm and accurate in Rios in right field. Probably the best arm. One on one to Baxter. Line drive, base hit. Here comes Davis around third, and the Mets are going to win it. Baxter with the walk off pinch hit in the bottom of the 10th and the Mets win it one to nothing. Baxter hit it hard enough and in a good enough spot that Ike Davis could walk on in with the game's only run and the Mets pull it out of the bottom of the 10th. On a night when Met pitchers faced 31 batters and retired 30 of them. Well, just outstanding pitching on both sides. Robin Ventura, manager for the White Sox, just daring Baxter to beat his White Sox by leaving Jones in there and leaving his left hander Thornton in the bullpen. Little breaking ball inside, quick bat by Baxter. Once that ball eludes Rios, in with the winning run is Mike Davis. No need for a pinch runner. Mike Baxter's first career walk off hit the Mets third walk off win of the year. And the Queens kid drives in the game winner for the Mets in the bottom of the 10. Well this night for most of the night was all about Matt Harvey and his absolute dominance nine innings. Perfection ruined only by a skinny infield hit in the seventh inning off the bat of Alex Rios. 12 strikeouts, no walks for Harvey. He winds up with a no decision in what was his greatest moment as a major leaguer so far. But it's Mike Baxter who winds up being the hero in the bottom of the tenth, and he's standing by with Kevin Burkhart. You know, Mike, did it feel only right to have to win a game like this, especially the way Matt pitched today? Yeah, you know, when he comes out and throws a game like that, he was brilliant tonight, so uh, I'm glad we got the win for him. At the very least, at least the pie duties have gone back to the, the normal guy, Justin Turner back. You know, do you, do you feel good about that? Your face seems in good shape. I'm just thankful it wasn't Bucky. <laughs>
How about for you? You get the walk-off day. What's your mindset going up there knowing that a base hit wins it? Well, he's got a good sinker, you know, trying to get a ball up in the zone, uh, get something good to hit, and it worked out. You know, Mike, what is the feeling as you guys are all watching Matt pitch tonight? I mean, at one point he was pretty lonesome on the bench, obviously, but tell me what it's like for you guys watching what he was doing out there. Yeah, it's so impressive when he goes out there, he pounds his own. You know, he gives us a chance to win every time he takes them out. So, uh, you know, it was good we came out on top tonight, even though he couldn't get the win. You know, how about offensively? When you're in a game like this, 0-0 zero, zero game runs are tough to come by. At what point do you try to try to avoid the frustration? Oh, you know, I think we got to stay with the plan. Uh, that's kind of what we've been saying all season. And, you know, it worked out in the end for us, so it's a good one. Right, lastly, how do you stay ready? You know, you're waiting all game. How do you stay ready for a moment like that for you? Well, you just get excited when you get a chance to get in the game. So uh, I'll take it. Mike, good job. Congrats. Thanks, Kevin. Mike Baxter, one of the heroes tonight for the Mets. Let's go back up to you, Gary. All right, thanks, Kevin. There's your city game summary. Only the second extra inning one hitter in Mets history. Terry Leach pitched the first one. This one a combined effort. Matt Harvey and Bobby Parnell who winds up the winner. But Harvey just enormous tonight. Only an infield hit. No walks and 12 strikeouts. That close to a perfect game. For every Mets win, the Mets Foundation is proud to contribute $2,500 to the Cats Women's Hospital and the Cats Institute for Women's Health. For more information, visit NorthShoreLIJ.com slash KIWH. This win brings the total contribution so far this season to $32,500. There's your Audi Mets box score. Mike Baxter with the game-winning RBI as a pinch hitter in the bottom of the 10th inning for the only run of the game as the Mets win it from the White Sox in 10. First game the White Sox have ever played in Flushing and it ends a familiar sight for Robin Ventura. Player getting mobbed before he got to second base. Right after we're done here it's WB Mason post game live with Chris Carlin and Bobby Ojeda back in the studio. Mike Baxter sends everybody home happy at City Field with the RBI hit in the bottom of the 10th. The Mets with a 1-0 win. We'll come back with more from City Field in a moment.